moving. And report on closed session, please. So the council reviewed the item on the listed closed session agenda um, and took no reportable action. Great, thank you. And some additional materials. Staff distributed and uploaded additional materials related to item 7A. The minutes for the special meeting held on the 3rd were updated. There are copies for review on the dais and copies were made available as a part of the agenda packet online. Move on to item five, which is oral communications by members of the public. Um, these would be on any comments on any of the consent items, not on or any other items that are not on the um, regular general government agenda. Do we have any members of the public? Yes. I did. You sign ahead of time. Sure. Um, thank you. My name is Susan Gibbs Bennett, and we have a quick question. We have a home on Grand Avenue. After losing a portion of the wooden fence from cliff erosion, the city has put up a cyclone fence. We would like to know what the city has planned for the walking path along Grand Avenue, and when would the cyclone fence be possibly removed? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Goran Klubic. I live here locally in Santa Cruz County. I want to thank the Capitola Police Department and one sheriff's deputy who responded to an emergency at 41st Avenue McDonald's one time. It was maybe two or three days ago, where a doggy was a dog was being abused at Capitola Public Library by a disabled veteran. I myself served in the army, so I know he should not be doing that to a poor animal. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name is John Haken, and I live at Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates in Capitola. As you can see, there are quite a few number of uh, concerned residents from that mobile home park in the audience for you to see. As the council is well aware, in March our landlord gave us notice that starting June the 1st, our monthly rent will increase by $358 from $641 to $1,000. That's over 55% increase. It turns out that the landlord also wishes to pass through any and all government assessments. If this includes the park's property tax, that could add another $90, $100 a month, making the raise more than 70%. This is to be determined whether that's true or not, but it looks like it could be a possibility. Approximately 50% of the residents of the park, myself included, are senior and are on fixed income. We will struggle with such a huge rent rise. For every $100 rent is increased in the Bay Area, the home resale price is typically decreased by $10,000. So in our case, our properties have just been devalued by $35,000 at least. The 68 spaces in the park with a 350 month dollar rent increase, this amounts to over $285,000 a year. That money could have been spent locally. Something for you to consider. And in the future, further rent increases will also reduce any amount that's been spent in Capitola. Us residents have formed an HOA, met with and initiated negotiations with the landlord. We have also been meeting with the city's community development department for guidance on resources and programs that could exist. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I just want to uh, 
briefly say any other uh, comments about the Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates can be taken during item 8B during the uh, general government portion of this evening. Is there any other public comment that um, has to do with either the consent item or anything that is not on general government this evening? Seeing none here, do we have anybody online? There are no hands raised on Zoom, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Okay, that'll take us to uh, staff or city council comments. I think we have some from staff. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Recreation Division Manager Mickey has a update for us. Good evening, Mayor, council members. Um, I would like to uh, let council as well as the public know that recreation is currently doing recruitment for rec leader one and two for positions that would be working in our summer camp program. And so we encourage anybody to help get the word out. We are actively looking for those talented individuals that want to help make a summer camp experience wonderful for the youth of our community. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And I think we have one other announcement here. Director Hurley. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to announce that the housing element went live yesterday and is on our website at cityofcapitola.org and under the community development page. So the 30-day uh, public review is now open and we're looking forward to getting comments submitted by the public. We also have um, a community meeting next Tuesday at 6 p.m. via Zoom and there's a link online for that as well. And at the next planning commission meeting and city council meetings, the first two meetings in June, June 1st and June 8th, we'll be focusing in on the update and hoping to get more public comment then as well. So thank you. So thank you. Anything else from staff? Um, just piggybacking off of what our community development director spoke on, um, there is also a um, more of a countywide uh, housing conversation being had, which Katie and I had the pleasure of being able to participate yet just on Zoom, so we will be recorded, but other mayors from the county will be speaking tonight with Lookout Santa Cruz, um, so if anybody's interested, um, I think it'll probably be able to be viewed after the fact as well. All right, so we'll move on to item seven, which are the consent items. Um, they'll be en enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Uh, no more separate discussion on these items. And we can go with a motion and a second. Move approval of consent. Second that. Great, first and a second. May we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Clark. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. That passes unanimously. We will move on to item 8A, which is the much anticipated wharf resiliency and public access improvement project. Uh, right now, the recommended action is to approve the plans, specifications, and estimate for construction for the Capitola Resiliency and Public Access Improvement Project, uh, which is part of the phase two, and authorize the public work staff to advertise for construction bids and design and engineering for the wharf rehabilitation project phase two. We have Ms. Khan here to put us through. And Kayla, sorry. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, we are pleased to bring you the Capitola Wharf Resiliency and Public Access Improvement Project. Uh, just up top, I wanted to say this project is a very long time coming. I will say every single department in the city has touched this project in some way. So it's been a really big collaborative effort and the Department of Public Works is just really proud to be a steward of this project. Um, I will be tag teaming this presentation today with myself and our uh, Public Works Project Manager, Kailash Muzamdar. Uh, next slide, please. I have 
bit of a lengthy presentation just to give you the full scope of this project. We'll start out with the background. Kailash will give us the full scope of the project, which is quite significant and substantial. We'll go into funding, schedule, public outreach, and wrap it up with a recommendation for authorization to bid the project this evening. Next slide, please. So a bit of background on this project. The city acquired the wharf in 1979 and did their last major renovation in the 1980s. Um, and 2015 was really the birth of this current uh, project uh, with the Condition Assessment and Resiliency Study by Boffitt and Nuttall. The uh, purpose of the study was to look into how to make the wharf less vulnerable to storm actions and breakage and to inform and strategize goals for uh, funding of a future project. Uh, from that, the city commissioned a 10-year plan for, uh, for this project. And then in the same year uh, was the initial approval of Measure F. Um, so with this Measure F funding, uh, the city commissioned a design also with Moffin and Nickel for the design of the wharf and flume and jetty projects. And from those concept designs in 2017, there were also surveys, preliminary design, environmental and public outreach regarding this wharf project. Uh, that uh, effort led into our project of design alternatives which took into account a lot of different alternatives for the wharf, including raising the wharf, the full elevation, just partial the elevation, full wharf replacement with different materials. Uh, the city ended up having a subcommittee of council members and staff to really go over this project alternatives report to really consider uh, what method to go to to ensure the future of our wharf. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, we landed on our current design in this current resiliency project, which is to primarily widen the uh, trestle at its current elevation using pilings that will be able to be um, raised if desired in the future. Um, raising the full wharf ended up being about double the cost of this initial project, and that's why it wasn't pursued um, and is not being pursued at this time, but the way we are building it will allow to raise it in the future. So with that, a full, a full scope and plans were prepared. Uh, the project initially went to the Planning Commission in 2020, uh, which Kailash will go into later on in our presentation. That year, we also see, received a grant from the California Coastal Conservancy of $1.9 million. Um, the following year, ahead of the Phase two project that we're speaking about today, a Phase one project was completed. It replaced some pilings under the wharf that had been damaged that needed immediate repair prior to be able having all the funding to do this larger project. And honestly, that project saved us a lot of damage from last winter's storm doing these repairs uh, prior to the overall project. Then as you all know, in December of 2022, we received a federal grant of $3.5 million, uh, which rounds out our funding for the wharf and all the amenities that come with it. Uh, next slide. And also, as you all know, there's a giant hole in the wharf right now. So we had some significant damage in January of 2023. So this project will not only repair that damage, but also do the uh, widening of the wharf that we had intended on all along. Um, initially, staff had intended on bidding this project for a start time in fall, just to meet our, um, our permit requirements from the Coastal Commission. Um, to not interrupt our summer programming that we have out on our beach and wharf. However, since there is no access to the wharf right now, we're able to start a few weeks sooner. Um, with that, I will hand it off to Kailash to go over the scope of this project. Great, thank you, Dr. Khan. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to kind of bring this to you. It's been years in the making and, and happy to have the opportunity now to rebuild this wharf. Um, unfortunately, we did have this damage, um, but the damage does highlight exactly why we, we uh, delved into this full effort back in 2015. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide provides the overall picture of the repairs and improvements that are, we'll be making to the wharf, starting at the, uh, the outward or head of the wharf, um, we have damage that was sustained during this most recent storm event. We lost a lot of railing there. Um, that will all be repaired. The entire, the entire wharf itself will have all new decking and any of the damaged piles, stringers, and all the uh, elements of the, the existing wharf will be repaired in addition to the widening portion that is highlighted in yellow there. As you move towards the uh, 
Towards the north there, we have a section that there are going to be a new bathroom installed there, and there's a slide later that will go into more detail on that restroom. Um, as you move towards the now narrower section of the wharf, there is what we reference as the trestle. At that outward end, there is as well, there's a security gate that's currently in place. Uh, the new gate will be matching in design and style, but just be uh, added in width to accommodate the new width of the wharf. The narrow uh, trestle section of the wharf was identified as the weakest section of the wharf um, in our resiliency study and alternatives analysis. And so the effort what we will have here is all of the piles in that segment will be fiberglass or composite piles that will be much stronger from a uh, damage and impact um, aspect as well as being able to be built vertically off of down the road if there were plans to raise the structure. As you may have seen in some of the photos, we the damage that we've sustained to the wharf comes both from wave action and oftentimes from uh, large debris that ends up coming kind of at that angle with the wave. So this, this further strengthens that area that is the most subject to damage. Uh, moving down towards uh, the foot of the wharf, we have the kind of iconic uh, archway that says Capitol Wharf, that's the entry or, or decorative gate. That gate will remain as is, but may move closer to the foot of the wharf um, because its its current width won't accommodate the future width, and so that'll match with the, the immediate entrance of the wharf and be placed there. And then there also at near the foot of the wharf will be a new another bathroom that uh, we'll go into more detail at a further slide. And this is the overall project, and now we'll get into a little bit more detail as we go through the slides. So if I could go to the next slide, please. Uh, this slide highlights the damage that we did sustain this January. Um, there at the head, we had quite a bit of damage to the decking, as well as a loss of almost all of the railing at the head of the wharf. Overall, we lost more than 30% of, of all the railing on the wharf as a result of the storms that we observed in January. Um, and then there highlighted in green is the area that was lost where we were, you know, the obvious gap in the wharf right now, where we lost approximately, I think, eight piles and in, in, in the neighborhood of 100 linear feet of damage, both to the decking, stringers, piles, everything in that area was damaged. And so all of those areas will be repaired um, in addition to the widening work. So overall, the scope of this project really um, didn't change too, too much as a result of the storm damage. We had, we it grew, but it was not um, outside of, we didn't have to do any redesign. We really were able to keep marching forward with the design that we have proposed. Um, because it, it, it was designed to, to address this very problem that we observed happening this year in January. Uh, next slide, please. So going back to the uh, steps that we've gone through from the Planning Commission side, back in 2020, prior to going forward with the Phase 1 project, we brought the project to Planning Commission to review all the, uh, the design elements. And, and at that meeting, uh, the main things that the Planning Commission weighed in on were the need to maybe review the entrance gates, the security gate, and the restrooms, because at that time we hadn't had full design plans completed and didn't have all of those fully flushed out. And so Planning Commission asked that we come back to them prior to bidding the project when those elements of the project would be addressed. Um, because the phase one project only addressed piles, we did not go back to planning commission prior to the phase one project, but now going into this phase two project, which is the overall restoration of the wharf, we did need to come back to planning commission. And so last week we had a meeting with planning commission, had a lot of good input from the planning commissioners. Um, and I think, next slide please. Oh, we did go, so what they wanted to review as well uh, was the, um, I forgot to mention the pile type itself. And so during our permitting process with the project, we had to go through a historic evaluation of the wharf. And one of the elements that was identified as kind of a key component of the wharf is that it's made, uh, it's a it's a wood framed structure. And there was some concern initially uh, identified with the new pile type being something that would stick out and be too, too different and maybe cause a, a change in the overall look of the wharf. But as you can see here, those piles that are used right there at the landing, right behind that yellow boat, are the are the exact same piles that we plan to utilize in this in the widening and uh, repair effort that is um, 
we've brought to you here tonight. Those piles are made of fiberglass and are filled with either sand or a concrete to provide additional strength and and also they can as far as the building vertically off of them you can you can you can put a platform on top of them because they're designed to have that structural load. The issue with a existing wooden pile, you can't build vertically off of those just because they don't they don't uh, accommodate that that additional um, load that would be placed upon them. Um, so in our historic evaluation, the we did uh, w it was settled upon that these piles would be acceptable to be used, wouldn't change the overall look and structure. And in addition, we found that after they've been in place for a few years, they do start to uh, generate the you know the different uh, sea life that clings to the piles and kind of has that classic look of having um, barnacles and things like that when we'll see otters pulling barnacles off there and that, that still that still takes place now so it doesn't change too much it just kind of gives us a new material that will last much longer and and further fortify the wharf next slide please and then here we have a, a sh showing you the two locations for the gate. So there's the entrance gate, which is more of a decorative gate, and our security gate. Um, the way that these gates work in operation, the security gate was installed around 2000, and it was installed as a result of lots of different things that were, were taking place out at the far end. We were having issues with vandalism, fires, uh, breaking in of the buildings, and, and just overall public safety. I did, we did look into um, the origination of, those, of that gate and, and reviewed this with our uh, uh, PD staff as well. And from, from all angles, we see this as a very necessary element for the, for the uh, security of the buildings and um, the facilities out at the head of the wharf. The entrance gate was done as a decorative piece to, to somewhat match the transition from the Venetian court area onto the wharf. And I did speak with the, the architect who designed this structure, ensuring that moving it and placing it at the foot of uh, the very entrance to the existing wharf would not be problematic and we'd ha we shouldn't have any issues with that as far as its conflict with our existing utility or, or anything else. And, and we'll be um, able to still have people take their pictures there at Capitol Wharf standing on, on, a, on the decking and still have that nice view behind them. Next slide, please. Here we have a, a kind of a rough rendering of what the location is gonna be for that existing entrance gate. So it's gonna be pushed forward to be just near the entrance, probably about seven feet. It's, I think we're about seven feet back from the corner. So it allows those, those gates to typically be open as they are in most conditions, except when we close the wharf when we know there's either large storm events coming where we know there might be some danger to have pedestrians and people out on the wharf or if there's any other events that we need to have the wharf closed, those, those, are, those gates will be, be closed. But otherwise, they're open to allow this to be open to the public. Next slide, please. Here's another angle of that same area um, showing which direction we're gonna move that existing structure. This also gives us an opportunity to take a look at where the new restroom is gonna be. So in that top left corner is the space that we're planning, what we currently use for a porta potty comes out seasonally and it's, it's quite heavily used in the summer months. And we'll now have a permanent restroom there with three, three stalls and providing restroom facilities for the public, both using the wharf and Hooper's Beach and that portion of Capitola Beach. Um, and as you probably know, the only other public restroom is all the way over by the Esplanade Park, which is quite a distance if you're a beach guard and you're over here. So this is a facility we really think is gonna provide a lot of use and benefit to the community. Next slide, please. Here again, just as a picture to show you where that existing security gate is, and this angle gives you an, an ability to see what we're, um, where that widened section is. So on the bottom left side, that corner is approximately the width of the new trestle segment, so that will extend all the way back, and so the width will be wider, uh, necessitating us to have a larger security gate. That gate will be exactly the same as in, in design, just wider to, to match the um, new width slide please and here's a quick picture of what that is from uh, from the plan drawings slide and moving on to the two restrooms so these restrooms um, are two different types of prefabricated restrooms and they had a few different constraints that we had when we were needing to select these so starting with the one at the head of the wharf um, the, it's quite a tight area you have the two large 
dumpsters that are, are placed there as well as three parking look stalls. And so in order to provide a public restroom in this location, we had to have something that was fairly compact, but still had all the amenities we were looking for. So this bathroom does provide ADA access. It has a, a baby changing table and is uh, well suited to be out in the marine environment um, as far as being able to weather um, it, the weather and then also for cleaning and maintenance purposes is, is quite a utilitarian bathroom from that standpoint. Um, we, we have observed this in different locations from uh, staff and, and our um, design team has, has investigated these bathrooms and everyone seems to think this is a great fit for what we have out there. The reason why this bathroom was looked at to be an independent structure was that back in 2018 or 19 when we were directed to move forward with this project, the two buildings were omitted from the project design and so we needed to provide a restroom facility that was independent of those two buildings. Next slide please. Here we have a zoom in of those the location of where those bathrooms are going to go and what you have here is on the plans we have the uh, the plan to plumb for two restrooms but only planning to install one at this time if it does turn out to be that, that we feel like there is additional need um, that way it'll be much easier to install that second restroom and so the the design you see there kind of has one a little bit more ghosted to represent where it would be if we decided to put it there, but otherwise um, just the one on the left will be the one that will be installed. Next slide, please. Here we have a, kind of a picture showing all the interior. If you wanted to take a closer look of how the inside is laid out and how the door operates. Um, at Planning Commission, they did ask that this get revisited for any aesthetics that could be added to it, um, changing potentially the, the sign on the door itself can be wrapped in a different photo. You can have, we've seen a lot of different um, options for how this can be artistically enhanced on the exterior. Um, and so that will be part of a, a secondary process before these get ordered that we'd be able to have that incorporated into the wharf design. Next slide, please. Here we have a rendering of that uh, first bathroom at the foot of the wharf that's going to have three stalls. Um, this is kind of an angle to show you where it would be and a mock-up kind of where its proximity is. In, in the plan drawings, it's actually a little bit further back against the railing and the ADA landing that will be in front of it to accommodate those stalls will, will be in line with the railing there so that it doesn't jut out into the area that we've deemed being the um, vehicle access point. So we'll have vehicles staying on the left side of the wharf, having the right side in this picture be the pedestrian ways. And that also provides further separation of those activities, enhancing kind of the user experience. So if, I don't know if you've been out there when a car drives out there, you kind of feel like you got to hug up against the railing. And this, this will then provide further separation and, and allow that to kind of transition more smoothly. Slide. This is the uh, zoom in of the diagram of that war of that bathroom at the base. It's a three stall bathroom. The first stall is an ADA compliant bathroom that also has uh, a, a ch baby changing station, and the other two are, are single stalls, and all of them would be ADA accessible. So, Planning Commission last week, um, what they asked for us to do is, is approve this final design that we have here for you tonight. Um, with the condition of asking to relook at the, the Portland Lou, which is the name for the brand that's out at the head of the wharf, to see if we could make any enhancements aesthetically to the exterior of it. And likewise for the, um, the Exilu, which is at the base of the wharf, to make sure that there are um, further look at the exterior facade that can, can be added to that restroom just to match with the overall design that we're, we will be working on for the entrance to the wharf with additional signage that will be required as part of our grant process and then also just to provide a more cohesive and, and pretty look as you come onto the wharf. And then lastly, they did ask that we investigate the need for that security gate. I think we've done a pretty good job of, of looking back at the history of that and, and speaking with those that were around when that was first initiated and why it was here and feel very confident that it's a definite need that we need to continue to move forward with. And our recommendation tonight is to bid this project as presented to you tonight with the restrooms, gates, and railing replacement as they are. I uh, wanted to highlight 
the extensive permitting process that we did have to go through over the last handful of years. We've already checked back in with all of the agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, Regional Water Quality Control Board, Coastal Commission, Fishery Service, and the Marine Sanctuary to make sure that our project, um, though it grew to, to a small amount by adding the damage, that we're still in compliance with those permits and can move forward um, as, as we have them now. And with that, I think we'll move on to uh, pass this back to Director Khan. Um, so to address some of those concerns that the Planning Commission had, staff proposes to run that into the scope of the Capitola Wharf Enhancement Project. This is an independent project of the Wharf Project. It would not infect at all the bidding or construction of the project we're speaking about tonight, but it will include extra public outreach to complete a design for ancillary improvements to the wharf. Um, potential scope may include enhanced lighting, seating, and entranceway and other visitor amenities. Um, fund, the city intends to collaborate with a private funding group to do fundraising for this project. Um, so the um, council and uh, the community will have more opportunity to comment on this portion of the project for visitor serving amenities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as far as cost goes, also included in the recommendation for this evening is an amendment to the Moffitt and Nickel contract. They've been with us since the beginning. Um, the most recent um, revision to this contract was intended to bring us all the way through construction. However, due to the storms and having to uh, do additional permitting and additional uh, design work, um, there is another amendment needed for this uh, contract. I will also note that the first two phases of this contract, the conceptual plans preliminary engineering also included the flume and jetty projects from their concept, concept plans to completion. So this isn't all just for the wharf, but it is all under one contract. Next slide, please. Um, funding for this project uh, is coming from a lot of places. So in addition to Measure F and General Fund, there are the two state and federal grants that we mentioned before, and also insurance money uh, the city will be receiving due to the damage on the wharf. The wharf is one of the city's um, insurable items. Um, our expenses so far include the Moffat and Nickel contract in that phase one construction project that we mentioned previously. Um, so total incurred expenses of about $1.6 million with this project anticipating to be 8.9. That includes bid alternative items. Those bid alternative items are utilities and a few extra piling improvements. These are not um, essential to the, or the success of this project or the safety or repair of the wharf. However, it would utilize a um, economies of scale. So that is the intention that if there is funds available to do these additional improvements, that we would do them at this time rather than waiting 10 to 15 years when they're completely deteriorated. Um, we intend on bending this project, assuming that we get authorization this evening in the next few weeks. I will say that there are only a few outfits who do this kind of work and that bidding has been really volatile in general in public works land here in the past year and a half. Um, so we will see what we get when we get there. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so our tentative project schedule, we are here today to ask for authorization to bid um, with the intention of awarding a contract in summer of this year, probably in July. From there, we anticipate an eight to nine month construction period that includes a lead time to obtain materials with a hopeful opening in summer of 2024 slide please so you can't read it from here but that nice little uh, banner there also has the same schedule this is currently out on the wharf this is part of our public outreach in the corner of that banner there's a QR code that directs people back to the public works page of this project thanks Julia <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yes it provides just general information in a rough schedule of the project but you can click on the or scan the QR code and get all the details you would ever like about this project. Uh, next slide, please. So that is part of our general public outreach, which also includes information out on the city's website and social media. Um, city staff has been in direct communication with organizers of project or of um, events that usually go around the wharf, such as the Mermaid Triathlon and other events where they would like to swim around the wharf to try to accommodate their needs for this year during construction. Um, other project outreach includes direct communications with residents in close vicinity of the wharf in that parking area, and they'll be continued to be con 
be in contact with them prior to the project and throughout the construction of the project. Next slide. And with that, I have the uh, recommendation up on the screen and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. I will also say that Brad Porter of Moffat and Nickel, our design team is on the phone if you have any burning technical questions about stringers or piles or anything of the sort. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation. I know everybody is waiting for all the lovely information. Do we have um, any questions? Yeah? The scope of work, um, I don't remember which slide it was on, but it included the railings and the piles. It didn't include the decking. I'm assuming the decking is going to be replaced as well. Is that part of the scope of work here? Correct. Um, and then the construction timeline, does that uh, eight to nine month period include any buffering time that for any storms we might face this winter? Or is that just assuming that storms don't hit us the way they did this time? It'll take eight to nine months. It does consider the fact that it is being built over winter. It does not anticipate anything catastrophic. So it, it, yes, the project will be weather dependent, but it did take into account the fact that the project will be under construction during the winter months. So like in a, in a summer construction season, maybe it would have been six months or winter. So we're thinking eight to nine. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I just had one, uh, two, sorry. Um, What's the status of the buildings that are on the wharf? So that is slightly unknown. We have been out on the wharf once or twice. They are not in a condition where they're going to fall on anyone, but as soon as we have access to get someone safely out there to do a full investigation, uh, we, the city intends on having someone come out and do that evaluation. Right. And then I was curious um, why for the end, the restrooms towards the end of the wharf, why are we thinking just using one stall? to begin with, is, is that just budgetary or just wait and see if it's a lot of use? Yeah, yeah, that was the intent, which was just to provide a restroom. Um, initially, when we kind of proposed this, there wasn't any uh, demand for more than just one restroom, but that's why we did in, in advance decide to plumb for a secondary restroom. And so that, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's okay. how. Yeah, okay, I was just wondering. But yeah, good idea to plumb for both. Okay, great, those are my to clarify, I noticed one of the bathrooms, one of the restrooms was one restroom unit, but it had three stalls, correct? Is the, and the other one is just one stall? Correct. Oh, okay, okay, great, thank you. Yeah. And one quick question, oh, and we're gonna continue to have the restrooms in the restaurant. Yes, and, and yes, if so, that, that's correct. The restrooms that are there aren't, aren't being removed, but there would be then the opportunity for the, the tenant to modify the layout interiorly and to, to change the location of that restroom. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? Greg Tedesco, Capitola. Um, with due respect to everybody in the room, I don't think anybody knows more about the wharf than I do. But being a past owner, being a kid that redecked it when Tom Shanahan had it. And I have some concerns, but the main one is that the engineering company has errors at emissions insurance. Because when the wharf was re the wharf currently is about 150 feet shorter than it was designed to be. And the reason for that was the engineering company, Brown and Caldwell from wherever they were, missed so much rot and damage that the city ran out of money uh, because of all the pilings and structure that had to be redone um, I'd hate to see that happen again. So if it does happen and the engineering company misses all this stuff, I'd like to be, have the city be able to come back and recoup from them the extra money that's lost. Um, that was one thing. Um, the other thing, um, I talked to Jessica months ago about the wharf, she's in public works, uh, uh, about buttressing the front of the wharf very similar to what Santa Cruz Wharf has. Santa Cruz Wharf, as it comes up, all of the piles are put together with timbers. So you don't get the rocking like we've had. They put in batter piles. They've done all this other stuff. But I think the bow of the wharf, if that's what you want to call it, should be buttressed more. The other thing is um, coming down the wharf, 
Um, the area where the wharf is broken historically is where the wharf always breaks. It doesn't break forward, doesn't break towards the street. It always breaks right there because of the backwash off the cliff. And in this construction part, um, I would like to see that area of the wharf, about 100 feet of that wharf, be sacrificial. The deck would be sacrificial. In other words, the pile would be there, T-strapped to the pile cap, and maybe even put uh, uh, fasteners from the pile cap to the stringers. Because right now, I believe, it was 40-something years ago, I think that the stringers are just pinned. So the whole wharf, if the water's under there, will just come up. And that should remain the same in that area. The rest of it, they can fasten down. But I think that there should be a sacrificial area for the deck. So when that side wash comes and hits the top of the wave and brings the wave six feet higher than it is, that just the deck will explode and come off. Not the pile caps, uh, pilings won't break, and uh, stringers will remain, pile caps will remain, and all we have to do is redeck it and, um, and uh, uh, fix the railing. Another thing that I was wondering about is if there's enough fall uh, in the new restrooms at the foot of the wharf for them to for them to uh, have fall out to the sewer line, or we're going to have to install another pressurized um, uh, forced main sewage to get it from the bathrooms down to the the sewer where it'll have fall into the county. Anyhow, I can go on, but that's about it. Thank you so much. Comments? My comment is simply to uh, uh, express on behalf of the uh, businesses on the wharf our uh, utmost appreciation for the staff and and uh, and the council's uh, getting us to this first uh, step. Uh, we're very anxious, as you could imagine, to, to resume our operations. And uh, I just want to say thank you. So much. Hi, my name is Stephen Woodside. I about two hours ago got out of the water right next to the wharf. It was a little chilly, but um, I took another look at it, and I wasn't uh, thinking about this at the time. But uh, Mr. Tedesco made a comment that reminded me that that rebound effect creates some tremendous waves, particularly at a high tide, and. Hopefully the engineers are taking that into consideration. I don't know what the solution is. I don't have one to propose, but it does break there. There's a photo from the 20s, I think, a pretty famous photo that uh, we've maybe all seen. So that, that should be taken into consideration. The other thing I want to say is kudos to your staff, not only for this project, but for all that they did in the, in the village to bring Capitola back. Thanks. Thank you so much. else in house wish to speak don't see any do we have anybody online we do not have any speakers um, with their hands raised on zoom okay. well, we can bring this back uh, for council deliberation I want to say I'm really excited for this project I know we all are it's, um, going to be a really exciting moment this time next year hopefully when we're breaking a cutting a ribbon or whatever we're doing I don't know what what kind of ceremonial things you do for a wharf but it's going to be really open the gates it'll be really exciting um, so with that I'll uh, make a motion to approve staff recommendation I'll second great that is a motion and a second and I do just want to say thank you so much for all of the hard work um, and public has spoken as well that you guys really are doing an amazing job and um, I also just want to comment too I love the poster in front with the QR code I think that's killer and I think it's helping us kind of stay on top of things with the public and for anybody else that is curious when they come to visit so that being said may we have a roll call Councilmember Clark aye Councilmember Peterson aye Vice Mayor Brown aye and Mayor Kaiser aye passes unanimously Thank you so much.
We can move on to item 8B, which is the 930 Rosedale Avenue Cabrillo Home Mobile State Mo Cabrillo Mobile Home Park update. I don't know what I was trying to say. And the action tonight is just to receive the staff presentation. you hear me okay yeah. now can you hear me okay yeah. mm -hmm. um, this evening I'm here to present an update on the Cabrillo mobile home estate part um, and an update on the lease negotiations as well as AB 1035 and as you know there's many residents in the audience this evening So a little background on this, in 2011, the Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates entered a long-term lease with, their, with the park owner. In February of this year, the residents received a letter from the park owner um, notifying them of a rent increase. And in response to that, the um, residents got together and formed an HOA and also hired legal services. Um, on April 13th, 2023, the City Council authorized a letter of support uh, regarding AB 1035. And the pending item coming up is uh, the May 31st. In a few weeks there, the mobile home lease will expire. Next slide, please. So first, I just wanted to go over what is Assembly Bill 1035. It would, be a, it would have enacted statewide rent control on mobile home parks. There would be um, rent increases would be limited to CPI plus 3% or 5%, whichever's um, lower. And it would have been applicable to uh, rents as of January 1st, 2023. So it would have been retroactive if adopted on January, implemented January 1st, 2024. Unfortunately, um, the last legislative hearing on April 19th, when this was supposed to be heard, the uh, author asked for it to be canceled, and my understanding is it's due to some litigation that they're working on, and this is likely to return next year. Next slide, please. So the Cabrillo Mobile Home Park is located at 930 Rosedale Avenue, and there are actually 68 mobile home spaces. Sorry, that's a typo. The HOA estimates that more than half of the residents in the Cabrillo Home Park are, would qualify as low income, earning less than 80% of the Santa Cruz area median income, which currently is 107,350 uh, annually for a family of three. Next slide, please. Um, and just to go over the 2011 lease, which is in place to the end of this month, rent started at 475 month um, it's the space rent the um, residents typically own the coaches on top of the space um, the rent will in it increased with the consumer price index annually and the current rent is six hundred and forty one dollars per month the new lease is proposing to increase the rent to a thousand dollars per month as of June. next slide please so um, where are we today? So today, where are the residents today? So they've formed an HOA and they're working with an attorney um, on their lease negotiations. I've been meeting with the president of the HOA and a couple other um, residents on a weekly basis. So during those meetings, the HOA provides me updates on where they are in their lease negotiations. My understanding right now is that they've, um, the latest is to draft a response to the park owner and They'll be submitting their concerns and asking for certain things in their negotiations. Um, so it, it, as on behalf of staff, what we've been doing is we've um, provided information on local legal resources that are available, also rental assistance that's available. There is a program through the county, um, through Families in Transition is the nonprofit that's administrating that. I've put the park owner in touch with families in transition, or families in transition has their contact information. They have to make an agreement with the park owner before it can be applicable. 
before the residents can utilize it. There's quite a bit of paperwork involved. Um, we've also uh, given them resources such as the local mobile home resources for Santa Cruz County. I've looked into state programs. Today I had a call with HCD. There's a, an old program that's been revamped um, for manufactured housing opportunities and revitalization program or more. And this is a pretty exciting program. My understanding is there's $67 million available in this program. It hasn't, um, the, the NOFA is out there so we can apply for money here. And um, it can be utilized for acquisition of a mobile home as well as at the same time rehab. So you can uh, get funding to rehab the park uh, rebuild the infrastructure in the park, um, help the residents in the park rehab their units, their coaches as well. So it's a great opportunity. Um, the one thing with acquisition is that the owner has to be willing to sell. So um, we have not had those conversations with the owner directly at this point. Um, we've also uh, discussed with the HOA the potential for a nonprofit to come in and acquisition the park. So working with the, the owner. This is something that's happened on 38th Avenue where um, Castle Mobile Home Park is. And it's amazing. The rents are, are low and um, have, are stable. And uh, But at this point, the owner has not shown any interest in selling, unfortunately. So, But that the money for, through more would still be available if, if, there, if we were to reach an agreement on some type of, if you, they were willing to sell. Um, and if not, rehab funding is available through that. So next slide, please. So our recommended action tonight was to accept staff's presentation on the update of the Real Mobile Home Park. And that I'm available for any questions. So I had one question on the, the more program. Um, so you said rehab would still be available. So the city would would apply for that type of funding? Yes. And then if we don't acquire it, it's still possible that we can reach an agreement with the property owner to help with rehabilitation or? Correct. Okay. And, and my understanding is because it's a state program, it's a lot easier than the CDBG program, which goes through the federal government, which we, um, we had a rehab program in the last decade that was, it was really difficult to administer because of funding and how it's set up through CDBG funding. But um, in talking with um, someone from HCD, they said they're really trying to make this easier to utilize and um, you don't need to get three bids for every item. And there was just a, a lot of paperwork on that one. So this sounds like a that we can take it out to public comment on this item. Anybody in house wish to speak? I'd like to say thank you uh, Katie for all your hard work and uh, for the uh, council members to uh, listen. Um, ideally buying the park would be the ultimate solution. Um, other alternatives exist, uh, the rehab program, uh, but for us in the park, capping the rent would be uh, a good uh, second place. Thank you ever so much. Good evening, my name is Charlotte and I live also on Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates. And it's not that easy to ask for help, but I'm not only asking it for myself, I ask for everybody here, because it is really a very scary moment at this time. Young and old and retired and handicapped people, we all are in this together, and we bound together, and we really wanna have this solved. You know, we have to put $1,000 down, plus the utilities, plus the rest for living. You know, it's not that easy all. We are fighting for a fair rental solution and what you know we want to afford this all so that we can keep our house this is all we have you know it's our house and we can't sell it because suppose that we don't know what the homeowner or the, the 
the owner of the park will put on the next rent. So you sell your house and maybe the next person has to pay $1,500. So nobody wants to buy our house. It's going to get more and more expensive. We need something like a rent cap, like John said. I'm, I'm just, you know, we are all very terrified what is going to happen and we have no idea. I don't think that, you know, the park owner is really very negotiable to us. And, you know, we are, we are trying what we can. I'm very happy we have a good lawyer and I hope he can help us and that you can help us also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Douglas Castle, also a resident of Cabrillo Mahoma Estates. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if Charlotte quite said it, but I just want to put out the idea that if nothing else works, such as buying the park, Capitola City has an opportunity to right a wrong that was done in 2011 when rent control for mobile home parks went away. There was a coalition of people, I believe, with a lot of, you know, lawyers and <laughs> litigation on their side to convince uh, Capitola City to give up that fight. But at this point, I believe our park owner might be the one holdout where there isn't either um, ownership by members of the community in the park, such as a co-op where they own the land, or there's some other rental agreement that's set up. AB 1035, essentially, when you, you know, you can look at, review that slide later, but those numbers on the CPI for rent increases, or 5%, which is ever lowest, is similar to what state law and the mobile home residency laws offers for most or for many mobile home parks um, throughout the state where you're not in a um, where you're in between two jurisdictions for example it doesn't hold to like capital city where local ordinances or rules have to do that so there is an opportunity for us to capital city to take action on that and match what the mrl already has and what AB 1035 wants to do, we don't have to wait for AB 1035 and to see what the fate of that is. Capitola can actually help this community at this time by proposing rent, not freeze, but caps on in future uh, increases so that residents can have stability and can know what to expect and to have some kind of housing security. So I propose that the city council consider that to some degree and be willing to maybe talk with us and look at drawing up a plan around how that might look, because those numbers are exactly the same at the state level or at the, um, you, know, you know, both for AB 1035 and the mobile home residency law. And that's all we would ask for. We're not asking for, you know, man park manager not to be able to make a living and to increase rents and do well. We're just asking for some limitations so people can have reasonable expectations around their housing. So thank you very much. My name is Dave Denise. Um, there are certain instances where you go through and you don't want government interfering. I'm a capitalist, but I have a moral compass. And it's when somebody doesn't have a moral compass is sometimes when government has to get involved. They're slamming. They're slamming these people. I don't. It's not good. It's not a good thing. It's really a shock. So I just just want you to know how I felt and how many people here feel. Nice working class neighborhood in a nice area. You know, we, we could use some help. We really could. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the house wish to speak? I don't see anybody. Is there anybody else? Oh, sorry, we got one more here. Sorry. Hi there, that's no, okay. Um, so I'm actually not a resident of the community, but I am a long-term resident of Santa Cruz County, Capitola, SoCal. I was lucky enough to grow up here um, and go to school here. And I am here to speak on behalf of many of my neighbors who want to convey the value that having affordable housing 
conveys to the community and also speaking on behalf of these neighbors of mine to allow them to stay in their homes. Um, I want to be clear here in case it hasn't been stated or in case you don't know, the landlord or property owner of this estate of the mobile home park is one of the people who sued to get rent control ended in 2011 in the first place. And so he is enacting the exact goal of having rent control ended by increasing rent as soon as it was possible, as soon as their lease ended immediately, right? After a 12 year lease. In addition, this is a person who has many properties and is located in Santa Clara, right? So he is not a local community member. He is not somebody who is invested in keeping residents here and allowing people to live in Santa Cruz and Capitola or wherever, you know, in this area, no, like, no matter what their income is. And, you know, I consider myself incredibly lucky to be staying here and grow up here. In fact, one of the residents in Mobile Home Park here uh, worked at my elementary school 20 years ago. And I can't tell you what an impact it is to be able to see my neighbors around town, you know, and recognize faces as I grow up and get to live here. So I'm just asking you to do whatever it is in your power to allow these residents to stay here. And it, that's what matters most to us, or to me, and I think many of my neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, first I wanna say thank you. Thank you for coming to try and figure out whatever can be done to help support us. My name is Ginger and I'm one of the residents in the mobile home park. And I just want to reemphasize that I'm very worried about many of my neighbors. I'm a healthcare worker and I could work another day a week. We have many neighbors that are on social security and we may, they may lose their homes. I'm very worried about them. Um, and then also want to point out that it's not just the rent, but he's also proposing a contract to us that as it is right now in this initial contract, it stated he can still raise the rent every 90 days. It's a one year lease. So we are all terrified that if we sign this, even if we don't sign it, he could raise our rent again 50% in next year. We're, so um, uh, the idea of a rent cap, if there is anything this council could do to help us with that, we would all be so grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you really very much for supporting my community. Uh, my name is Kayla, and I'm a um, resident at Cabrillo Mobile Home. Um, all of us are fighting really hard against this, this gentleman or man. <laughs> but um, what happened is, for example, some people like me, I bought the house two years ago, uh, thinking that was a dream for my mother. I'm having three jobs to make possible to pay the rent. And when I get the house, he just uh, say, sign here, sign here. And I think at least uh, supposed to be kind of conscious from him to say in two years, the, the, the contract will expire. And he didn't. And now it's a surprise for me to pay a lot of money on top of what I'm paying for the mortgage. So I will really appreciate you do something not only for, uh, for me. My mother is 80 years old and many of the community are, are elderly and we really appreciate you can do something for us. And I really appreciate all the people behind us that supporting us and keep, keep supporting us. And thank you very much. Thank you. can go back online if I think there was somebody that had their hand raised maybe. So there is one speaker. I'll go ahead and allow um, Laura Tucker, if you can please unmute yourself. You'll have three minutes. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, great. Well, um, I, uh, I don't want to repeat anything that anyone has already said, but I, I uh, agree with all of the things that everyone has been saying and I really wanted to um, thank Councilmember Brooks for uh, asking for this report 
and council member Kaiser, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, for asking the question about the Moore program. Um, and uh, uh, Katie Herlihy and George uh, um, have been really great in meeting with us um, every week. Um, in regards to the, the legal resources available, um, CRLA, which is the California Rural Legal Assistance, are prioritizing flood victims right now, which obviously makes sense. You know, they only have so much staffing um, and there's a lot going on right now. Uh, there, I don't know if there's any help available possibly in the future with them. Uh, senior Legal Services said that they would only represent people individually and we just went ahead and pulled our money together and and hired a lawyer and are paying out of pocket. So we have some time, um, but we don't have deep pockets like uh, Vera Enterprises. Vera Enterprises, uh, when they bought the mobile home park, it was under rent control. Uh, and they were aware of that when they bought the mobile home park. Um, and so I think that there's, you know, quite a disregard for the, the residents who were had expectations of paying low rents because it was under rent control and um, you know many people are paying mortgages so when when we say we own the mobile home that doesn't mean you know that they necessarily own it outright and I believe several of them are paying mortgages to Vera Enterprises um, and then uh, I don't know that we've gotten much help from the Santa Cruz County Mobile Home Commission as yet. Uh, in regards to families in transition, I was able to get through to them and they said that they only served um, families with children under the age of 18. Um, and uh, I, there was possibly a misunderstanding about that, um, the person that I was speaking with and, and that there may be something in the works with this uh, MORE program. So I was happy to um, hear you ask about that. Um, we're in a crisis situation at this point. Our rent is going up in two weeks. And so um, uh, as far as nonprofit resources I mean really it's it's nothing has really panned out so far but I do I'm you know uh, kind of desperately optimistic that things um, that something might come through so I'm hoping that you might consider some kind of a stopgap measure just so that the lowest income of people in the park at least have some form of rental assistance while we are trying to you know secure our community um, we have, our community has deep roots in, in Capitola from the wharf, which I'm very excited about. It was hard not to get distracted, um, but I'm all for those fiberglass piers and widening it and all that. Um, at any rate, uh, I just wanted to, to really thank you for your concern as, as I know voters are, are watching and there a lot of them are renters too or they have family members who are renters um, or they care about renters they care about our mobile home park and the the children that are going up growing up there and uh here and and going to capitola schools and um so so i'm looking forward to seeing what what comes next and um i want to thank you for uh, getting together as city council members and um, coming up with some some action that will help us as soon as possible. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else online? So the next speaker on Zoom, um, Connor, if you will unmute yourself, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, thank you. Hi, good evening, city council. I'm not a resident of Cabrillo Mobile Home Park. I'm a community member. And I just wanna express my wholehearted support for the residents of this mobile home park against this unjust and exploitative rent increase. This is a housing justice issue. And I think a major duty of city government is to protect your residents from predatory profit-seeking actions like this. 
So please do everything in your power to act on behalf of these residents. Thank you so much. Thank you. There are no other hands raised on Zoom. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We'll take this back to council. Um, so starting with some questions about the presentation, has the Conflict uh, Resolution Center been involved in this at all? Not to my knowledge. Um, can staff, I don't know if the city attorney or, or others uh, on staff speak to the legal allowance of what the city is allowed to do, and if there was a will of the council through a vote to enact some kind of cap on rent increases, what a timeline for something like that would look like in terms of creating an ordinance, getting it in effect, et cetera, if this particular park is going to have rent increases on June 1st, what, what would it need to look like to meet that deadline? Is that is what I'm saying? Make sense? Yeah, so sure, the council could enact rent control. Um, we could enact an urgency ordinance, which doesn't have to go through the standard two reading process and take it would become effective immediately. So we could, in theory, do that at the May 25th meeting. Oh, yeah, that answered my question, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the reason I pause isn't because, I mean, certainly my office can put it together. Um, well, yeah, that was also part of, part of my question, right, is, is what, not just when it would become effective, but you know how I don't I don't know the process of writing these I don't know yeah, how much so, work goes into it so you know if we did it on May 25th would that be a reasonable timeline for you know you your office and and whatnot or would it be more likely that we would need a special meeting like next week I'm I'm not following because next week is before May 25th oh I'm sorry I mean I'm, yeah yes exactly that's what I'm saying if if we were to bring this to the May 25th meeting that only gives you one week until their rent increases would go up on June 1st, right? right? So, oh, okay, I, I see what you're saying. You would need to write the ordinance before our May 25th meeting, because then we would consider it the meeting, it would become, yes, my, my apologies. Yes, bring it to my you apologies. for adoption at the May 25th meeting. Okay, I see. Um, okay, so then is that a realistic amount of time, or would we, you know, for to- for the council directs us to do it, we'll do it, absolutely. If the council directs us to, bring you an urgency ordinance, that's what we'll do. And that could include, we, we would be able as a council to determine what the um, conditions of that are, right? It wouldn't have to be set to something the state did. It wouldn't have to be exactly, we would determine the conditions on that, correct? Yes. One of the um, one of the caveats about proceeding quickly, which is often the case when I am not trying to talk you out of this, I'm just saying this is the caveat with proceeding quickly with any urgency ordinance, is um, it's sometimes difficult to make a lot of changes on the fly because I, I haven't had an opportunity to research them and properly apprise you of the risk. And so what I would recommend if the council is interested in doing that, is interested in an urgency ordinance, you have a couple options. You could discuss it tonight and kind of figure out what you would like the contours of that ordinance to be. Um, you could tell me, you give me direction to draft an ordinance that is um, consistent with the law and pretty basic ordinance that caps rent, rental increases at X amount, or you could have a special meeting between now and the 25th to give direction. Um, you could, these, I mean, you could, we could have a meeting on the 25th and then if you wanted to give, if you wanted to have changes that we couldn't make on the fly at the meeting, we'd have a special meeting on the 30th or the 31st. That's not a fantastic option. Um, so. 
I think your options are really realistically to give direction tonight and if we need a special meeting between now and the 25th to give further direction, we can do that. But I don't know that it would be that complicated. So you might just consider giving direction tonight. And if I feel like I need more direction, I can communicate with the city manager and we can do a special meeting. Um, if it's challenged, if what we choose to do in our rent, if we, if the council votes to do some kind of rent, um, I'm looking for we've been using this whole night control control thank you um, and it's challenged um, and it essentially just goes away correct well no it it, it depends it, it really depends on what it, the court could strike it down Yes, the court could strike it down. If it is challenged, the court could strike it down. And also, if it is challenged in advance of that challenge, the city could negotiate a settlement with the challengers. It, it really depends on what the, what the ordinance looks like and what the challenge looks like. Um, so that's something, that's sort of what I mean. I, I, I would want to advise you on that specific to the ordinance. Sure, sure. So once we have kind of an idea of what the ordinance will look like, I can either, if I feel like there are specific risks, I can send you a confidential memo. Um, but I can give you more information once we know what the ordinance would look like. But in general, yes, if the ordinance is challenged, one remedy would be to settle in advance of the challenge. And if we lose the challenge, the court could strike it down entirely. Okay. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be dismissive of the expense of fighting a challenge. Right. Um, uh, yeah. I have a thought. Is it possible for us and have staff speak with the parks attorney come up with some ideas and then have a special meeting? Is that possible for staff? Um, I have spoken with their attorney. Uh, the parks, the HOA's attorney, and I, I do have some um, suggestions that he provided to me previously, and I could share that with our city attorney. And I will say it's a that's a little bit of an awkward position for staff because it sort of puts the city into the position of being, in some ways, an advocate for private residents. The city's authority is really um, regulatory, right? And so your authority is to um, uh, enact rent control to con use your regulatory authority to enact rent control or if you had the money buy the park and then you could regulate it but really sort of us negotiating is I'm, I'm not saying it's impossible it's just a little tricky um, what uh, Vice Mayor Brown suggested might be an option it, which is a third party mediator involved running between the park owner and the residents and the city would not be involved looking for some best practices. Somebody speak a little bit about um, the last rent control and what happened with that and the likelihood of being able to successfully pass the rent control ordinance. So I came to the city in 2008. And at that point, the city was embroiled. I think it was three, maybe four lawsuits with various park owners around the city's rent control ordinance. Um, at the time we were using outside counsel and it was costing the city a lot. Some of the, some of the months were more than $100,000 a month. Legal fees. Um, we, we were getting hit with Public Records Act requests and then legal challenges around the Public Records Act requests. They were doing basically a full court press on the city. And this was the owners of Castle, Brio and Surf and Sand, they were all basically just leveling their legal legal sites on the city. So at that point, um, the city ultimately decided that it needed to get out of rent control and there was there were various solutions negotiated for each part. We helped buy Castle Mobile Home Estates in partnership with a nonprofit. Um, we helped ensure that the folks at Surf and Sand were offered long-term leases, those with low incomes 
and everyone in Cabrillo got these 12-year leases, and then the city stepped back from the control. That's how we got to where we are today. I think that was, I think, a speaker mentioned that happened in 2011. I think that's exactly right. Um, that was a, it was a tough history. It was a tough time to go through that, for sure. You know, the city was facing a situation where we were spending more money on legal fees than we were maintaining our parks and our roads combined. Um, whether that's a likely outcome now, I I don't know. There certainly are fewer park owners who would be um, able to gang up and sue the city. There's just one versus three that we were dealing with previously. Since we're sort of talking a little bit about the risk, there's one more I should mention, which is as Vice Mayor Brown mentioned, um, the risk of the city being challenged for the ordinance, a direct legal challenge, which we would either settle or litigate. The other issue, the other risk is a possible referendum, which is essentially any time the city takes a legislative action, which is including passing an ordinance, um, anyone in the public can challenge it and call for an election to rescind the action. So um, I feel as though those challenges are somewhat rare, but it is out there. And to answer your question about the possibility of rent control passing, that would be up to five of you. It would be an ordinance that the council would consider. Oh, I see what you mean. Rent control is legal. So I, I think we could certainly write an ordinance that if it were challenged, we could defend a challenge. I can't speak to whether it would be challenged. Um, because people sue all the time, regardless of their chances of winning. Um, but certainly, when my office drafts an ordinance, <laughs> it is a lawful ordinance. So we will draft you a lawful ordinance in two weeks if that is your direction. Um, whether it is sued and we have to litigate, even though we believe it's lawful, I can't speak to that, unfortunately. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to be cagey. I just, is that, did I give you a complete answer? Okay. But I, but I don't think I need any research to answer your question. I think, or so perhaps I'm not understanding. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I have more questions that I believe would require research. Okay. So I'm just kind of curious. There are other similar examples in recent histories and how those unfolded, um, but I don't expect that you would have the answer to that at this time. I probably, do you mean in terms of challenges to rent control for mobile home parks? Yes. It, I, I, that I, I don't know. Yeah, and it would really would depend think. on the actual ordinance and the type of, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that that would be difficult to find. No, not right now, sorry. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the state of California in 2019 has their own um, rent increase limit that they passed that's no more than up to 10%, right? 5% plus local CPI or 10%, whichever is lower. And, you know, again, I don't think that there should be a um, complete moratorium on allowing property owners to increase rent or that it should be entirely unallowed but 55 percent is unbelievably outrageous um and i i just can't justify not trying to do something about that as a city um so procedurally there's nothing on the agenda for us to vote on tonight so if I were just to say that I wanted this to come back to council at the next meeting for the entire council to consider a mobile home rent control ordinance that includes that limit of annual rent increase to no more than 5% plus local CPI or 10%, whichever is lower, is that all I have to do? Is say I would like that to come back to council with that words and then council would determine at that time if they're okay with that at all? 
Um, sure. So my advice would be that other council members weigh in, and the reason is it's going to be a pretty significant um, uh, sprint for my office, which we will do, but it's going to cost the city some legal fees. And so I would want to make sure that fellow council members are on board before expending that. That would be my recommendation, and you can do with that what, what you'd like. But because of the timing, if you want to, if because of the timing, if your aim is to get something in place by June 1, I need to bring you a fully baked ordinance for for adoption right. on, I can't see anything, on May 25th. And right. so we would bring you an urgency ordinance notice as an urgency ordinance for adoption on that date. So if that's what you want me to draft, I would appreciate especially if other council members have different ideas of what, what it should look like so that we can bring you something as close to what you want on that day. Sure. So I guess what I'm asking my fellow council members is not to um, tell me if they are for or against this kind of rent control in our city tonight, um, but to share if you would be open to this coming back to the council next time and the full council is here, we could have a more in-depth discussion with the research that we might be asking for um, and a fully formed ordinance with that language that I just used about limiting annual rent increases for us to consider at that time. So that's, I guess, my, my ask my colleagues tonight is to um, weigh in on if you're okay with us weighing in on that at our next. And it is fine to clarify, even though there's no action on the agenda, it is fine to give me direction tonight. So you need to vote on it, but certainly you can give me direction without it being agendized. Absolutely. So, so this would no longer be considered the urgency ordinance or it would still fall within? It, it would be an urgency ordinance. A regular ordinance requires a first reading and passage, and it takes at least 60 days generally to have a regular ordinance take effect. An urgency ordinance um, can take effect immediately if we can make certain findings. So just to clarify, sorry. So if we bring it back next meeting and we all vote on it, then it is enacted, right? That's on that correct. Date. It would be effective the next day. I think it would be effective upon passage, Excellent, actually. Right, okay. Um, yes, of course. <laughs> and so, and when we're talking about this rent cap or rent control, we're really just considering mobile home parks. This isn't like a overall. That's what I'm suggesting. Okay. Okay. Um, that being said, I have a question, and I don't know if we have the means to answer this right now, but. Um, there was mention of other rent increases, possibly because this owner also owns some of the individual coaches and things like that. So that sounds like really messy and I don't know how, like would this, how do we control that if he also then owns these each individual? Are you asking if it would be an ordinance that's applicable to just this mobile home park or all mobile home parks? No, just um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to wrap my head around each individual that, each individual resident, if if he owns the coach himself and this person is paying their mortgage to him or the rent directly to him on top of the space rent, on top of the utility rent, whatever else he's trying to accrue, are they, it, will this, can we fit it in this ordinance to make it that those people are also included in the cap? I don't know if I'm like really getting in the weeds or. No, I, I understand, I think what you're asking and, and maybe I can clarify and Sam can help us out a little bit here. So in general, mobile home rent control laws deal with situations where there's an ARC owner who owns the land and then individuals own their coaches. Mm -hmm. So the situation, it sounds like you're describing, it's where park owner owns the land and owns the coach and is renting that coach to somebody to live in. That would be much more analogous to somebody living in an apartment complex where they're renting the apartment complex. So in my experience, I've seen those as two separate things. Some cities have historically had rent control on an apartment complex, but much more common cities will adopt rent control ordinances that deal with the situation where there's an owner of the land and then there's an owner of the coach and they're not the same, which creates this sort of this, this challenge, right? Because you have a mobile home that doesn't move and you're subject to whatever rent property owner pay, uh, 
will charge you. So I don't know if that helps at all. Um, I think that, so I am envisioning that this would be an ordinance that would just cap the rents of the space, not the coaches themselves. Okay, thank you. It would be different if that's the council's direction, but that is what it seems to be. Okay, let's, yeah, I just was trying to differentiate. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, I have one more salient bit of information to add, which is that an urgency ordinance requires a four-fifths vote to pass. Okay, okay. yeah, that was, that's what happened. Are there any other questions on this? Yeah. Not a question, but I just wanted to say I'm in support of the member Brown's initiative. Okay. So, um, as, as am I. <laughs> Could you ask me that question again, please, Mayor? So um, basically, I think what we are reaching for, um, Councilmember Peterson has also, sorry, has also stated that he is um, in agreement with Councilmember Vice Mayor Brown, sorry. Um, your feeling, I am also in support. Um, is that enough? Yes. So what are you looking, what is the cap? This is frankly the easiest thing to change on the fly, but humor me. What is the cap that you are looking to impose? Are you looking to impose a cap that is consistent with the state legislation? I think it's called like the Anti-Rent Gouging Act or something. The state legislation, which is a 10% increase or 5% plus CPI, or as Director Hurley, he just pointed out to me, Assembly Bill 1035, it is a little assembly bill 1035 imposes a lower cap than um the state legislation imposes on all other rentals uh 1035 which has not passed and may not we don't know imposes uh increase or increases limited to cpi plus three or five which other is lower i mean i'm inclined to want to go with the 10 percent because it's already a state law and i feel like it's easier to justify something the state already has in law as opposed to a bill that is currently tied up um that's just my particular thought on it you know what i could do i could draft it to be consistent with the state law and we could say that if 1035 passes it defaults to 1035. i'm super into that yeah mm -hmm. let's do that so uh, I would like to thank you for being the first time ever an attorney has gotten a round of applause. <laughs> so just to confirm, because I'm just to confirm, that hasn't changed anything tonight. This has to come back to us next time, and four-fifths of the council has to approve it for it to move forward. And then we'll face whatever challenge comes after that. And then um, if four-fifths doesn't approve, we could potentially... That's exactly right. You could bring it back as a regular ordinance. It would take longer to implement, but it would only require a three-fifths vote. Thank you. That's what we need. I appreciate it. Thank you all for speaking tonight. Okay. Well, changing gears here, uh, item 8C. This is the uh, City Hall Needs Assessment and Alternative Analysis. The recommended action tonight is to authorize staff to issue a request for proposals for a City Hall Needs Assessment and Alternatives Analysis Report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, before you is the City Hall Needs Assessment and Alternatives Analysis. Um, next slide, please. So we're here tonight at 420 Capitola Avenue. It's a seven acre site. It houses the Capitola City Hall, our police station, the Capitola History Museum, the police annex, and then lower and upper Pat Cove parking lot. So great site that the city owns. Um, currently, it, it, our building is aging and is older. And we're nearing a stage in which significant investment may be will be necessary to maintain functionality. Next slide, please. Um, 
In last year in March, the city council identified as a goal for a city hall needs assessment to be completed and allocated $50,000 towards this, um, towards the, the current budget cycle that we're in um, for the update to city hall and the police station. Next slide, please. So tonight, I'm gonna to give you an overview of what we've put together for an RFP um, and just wanna make sure that this is in line with what the city council was envisioning before we publish it. So really, just wanna make sure we're capturing what was envisioned. Next slide, please. So the first part of this will be a needs assessment, phase one, and it'll outline the existing conditions. It'll look at our, the site and the structures. It'll provide a visual assessment of the buildings, not opening the walls or uh, getting too deep into the, the structure itself. It'll also look at functionality and workspace standards. So um, looking at current measurements and how, to, how they're utilized within, this, within the different buildings. Looking at the community spaces, so the space that we're in today as well as the community room and how it functions for the public. And then also doing a qualitative analysis of the site and looking at environmental constraints and hazards. And from that um, first overview report, it'll also include a 20-year projection of what are the needs for the site, growing staff, and also for the public meeting space. Next slide, please. Um, so phase two would um, we'd take we'd bring phase one to the city council, um, and then phase two would be at the council's discretion to tell us to move forward. Um, so based on the findings of phase one, we'd move forward if directed by council to start identifying goals for the future of City Hall. Um, in the staff report, we mentioned that a study was done about a decade ago. And um, this time around, we're really, we're, we're focused on, let's get the public input on this in the beginning and hear what the goals are and have um, a community input meeting and identifying goals, really get the word out about community engagement strategies. That's part of that RFP is making sure that they submit a community engagement strategy. And then once we've gone through that process with the community on identifying goals for the site, then we'd bring it to city council to provide a long list of goals that came out of that process, the public process. And the consultant would present that to the city council um, and then during that meeting, the city council would work to narrow down those goals based on uh, your understanding of the first study that was published and the community's goals. So really getting that list shortened. Next slide, please. Um, and the third part of this is an alternatives analysis. So from the goals that the city council puts together, the consultant will create alternatives. And within this, we, um, the, the, um, there'll be at least three alternatives that will be um, created by the consultant for the city council to, to look at prior to giving direction. Next slide, please. Um, so within those alternatives, there'll be a written description of each alternative. There'll be a conceptual site plan, so a drawing showing ex like how things could be the new layout on the site, also quantitative data on the breakdown of the area per proposed use and function, um, cost estimates, and then qualitative analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of each alternative. Next slide, please. The tentative schedule is we would publish this in the um, next coming couple of weeks. And then the goal here would have a complete phase one by December of this year and then in January present to the city council and get direction on phase two. Next slide, please. So tonight we're looking for author, uh, authorization for staff to issue the RFP uh, for the city hall needs assessment, an alternative analysis report. So, and any changes that you'd like to see in that process would be great to hear this evening, um, or if you like the process that's laid out we're also looking for direction. Thank you. Great, thank you. Me neither. Any public comment on this item?
Good evening. I'm Dave Fox. I've lived in the city for 47 years, and I've really enjoyed it. But one of the things I see going on more and more in not only this city, but the county and everything, everybody wants to hire some outside party to take do a study for us. So the amount of money that you may be spending, you could pay her or another staff person to do a report. Our, our buildings are just not that big that we need to go to somebody else to do a study for us. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in-house? Seeing none, we can go online. There are no hands raised. Thank you. We will come back to council. Um, any deliberation changes to the steps? <laughs> anyway. Is that what you were looking, just to clarify, is that what you were looking for input on? Is just the timeline and the steps and? Yeah, is this the process you were envisioning when this was put on the um, budget last year? And uh, just want to make sure the way we're going about this is supported. What were the findings 10 years ago? I, what my understanding was the findings were we did need a new city hall. And the only problems that we're having with the people arguing back and forth was the public input. Exactly. So um, I will say when I arrived at city hall or to Capitol, it was one of the first public meetings I ever attended. And it was uh, there, people were not that excited about what the report had to say. Um, and they, I think the, the number one thing we were hearing is um, that there should have been more public input up front. And I think it was a different, the approach was a little bit different in that a developer approached the city on possibly doing a hotel development and there were, there were more pieces to it that um, were more of a proposal as well. So this is, let's take a step back, let's hear from the public first, see what the goals are that the public comes forward with. And then if it's something, if the city council wants us to pursue it further, um, based on that input, then we'd go to the next step. So. Go ahead. I'll motion to authorize staff to issue a request for proposals for a city hall needs assessment and alternatives analysis report. First and a second, maybe we have a roll call. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. So that'll take us to item nine, which is adjournment. Um, lots of great stuff worked out tonight. So thank you everybody for attending and have a great evening. Just a reminder to the city council that we have a budget hearing next Thursday. May 18th at 6 p.m. on your calendars. So that's our next meeting. <laughs>